Hello, welcome to the Freedom From Anger podcast. I'm very excited about our guest, David Nordell. He's a retired United States Air Force Command Chief Master Sergeant, over 30 years of service. He's coming to us from the beautiful state of Montana. He is very passionate about veteran transition and offers perspective on PTSD, moral injury, and other mental health challenges. He is also a author with a number one best-selling book, Giving Back, Life and Leadership, From the Farm to the Combat Zone and Beyond. It will be available on Amazon, and I will definitely put a link to that in the description. He's also the owner of maxfabconsulting.com. So if you want to check that out, just type in maxfabconsulting.com. And their mission statement is to empower emerging leaders and military veterans transitioning to civilian life to become the best versions of themselves so they can achieve their full potential. And they do that through delivering customized new and emerging leader training programs that include and support mental and emotional balance okay that was a mouthful so how you doing today dave i'm doing great man thanks for having me yeah that is kind of a mouthful but it's all kind of there isn't it and i appreciate the fact that we had a conversation before we did this which is great because get to know each other a little bit a little bit of our transition right because not every transition is the same but i think as we talked we'll find some similarities so yeah i appreciate you plugging the book the people that enjoy the book every book is not for everybody but the people that enjoy the book, they kind of keep it around as a kind of working guide to keep them grounded as they're going through their leadership challenges or their life challenges and those kind of things. So yeah, I hope it's helpful. But yeah, glad to be here and and let's dive in. I can go any direction you want. And the transition piece obviously is the passion right now with a little bit of different spin. And I'll actually tell you what I did this morning before we before we jumped on here, which is kind of cool. Well, just going back to the book real briefly, I got on Amazon yesterday and was looking at the reviews. And my goodness, just glowing, glowing responses from the reader. So I'm definitely have to pick up a copy of that. I was very impressed with the reviews. I appreciate that. Yeah, the reviews are good. They're legitimate reviews. And like I said, some people read the book and they enjoy it and others, they keep it at the side of their easy chair to reflect back on. So yeah, you'll notice in the book, it talks a lot about failure, right? Or challenges. And Boy, when you start to talk to people in, in large groups or when I speak or those kind of things, when you talk about failure, people really lean in. They really want to absorb that because I think they identify more with that because I think people are scared to be a little vulnerable and, and tell people, boy, I screwed this up. Everybody wants to hit a home run every time. And we try to, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. The book's full of that. I didn't hit a home run, but here's some things to think about and maybe to keep you from having to to walk a, a path that I did already and it wasn't successful mm -hmm. or just to have a little bit of a tool to keep you grounded and keep you focused and keep you healthy mentally. So you're telling yourself the right things. So I appreciate that. Oh, no problem. So yeah, you just kind of diving into it. So sure. Oh, I'll, I'll take you on, take you on the little journey. I grew up in a small town in Northern California as a fourth generation Portuguese immigrant of dairy farmers. So hence the, from the farm to the combat zone. And when the Air Force, when I was 19 and did a 30 year career culminating as a command chief master sergeant, which puts you in charge of a lot of people. And there's a whole leadership journey in there that goes along with that, which kind of gives you some things that you can write about the good, the bad, the failure and the success and those type of things. But really where I'm at, James, now is I've kind of been through the wash, rinse, spin, dry, hold cycle of a young man, a military experience, a military career, transitioning to the civilian world, having three main jobs where I was working for people in the civilian world and now working for myself in a consultancy with a focus on that last piece that I'm talking, the dry, bold cycle of this military experience. Because I tell people all the time, it's kind of embarrassing now to reflect back on that question that I would get from younger airmen me being an Air Force guy or soldiers or sailors or Marines. I was around all of them quite a bit where they would say, chief, tell us about what I should do when I get out. I've been in four years, been in six years and, and I'm getting out. And what should I do? And I said really wise things as a chief, like 
buy a tie, get some nice clothes, fluff up your resume, sit up straight in your chair, brag about yourself, don't be overly humble, and just be you because you're great. And we would send them off. That was the worst advice. That was the most <laughs> naive. I didn't know, right? I didn't know because I haven't been there. What I should have told the airman was, let me make a phone call to a friend of mine that's been retired for three or four years. And you talk to him or her, right, about how to do this. And so I still think today we've missed that piece, right? This is what we talked about. We've missed that piece. So we carry our rucksack, our proverbial rucksack, no matter what service we're in. We carry our rucksack. And the day we get to basic training, they throw it, us, throw it on our backs and they start filling it full of things. And it gets pretty heavy. After 30 years, it's really heavy. And then one day you want to just rip it off and be done with it. But in most transition programs, they want to get you a job because they think once you got a job, you're kind of good to go. Well, we as veterans, we come in a lot of things. Not every veteran has PTSD. Not every veteran has moral injury. Not every veteran has substance abuse or relationships with substance that's not healthy. But a lot of us do. And the end result of that sometimes, James, is a suicide rate, right? The VA will tell you 22. If you look at the civilian data, it's 44. I would say it's probably closer to the high end. That's Dave just taking a guess. But if you just kind of look at how veteran suicides classified in the VA realm and then all of the other things that are out there that could qualify as suicide, it's probably higher. And we haven't hit a home run with that. And when you start to peel that back a little bit, which I hate doing reactionary programmatics, I hate having really, really poor outcomes and then saying, well, maybe we should do this or should do that. We should have leading indicators that have us doing things ahead of time, which is we're going to talk about vet ready and what I just proposed to one of the congressmen on Capitol Hill an hour before we did this. We're getting some traction up there on Capitol Hill to have this discussion. So why in the world would we, let me give you an example. Military people are institutionalized just like prisoners, right? You're in an environment that is that has its own language, it has its own culture, it has it has all of the things that you have to learn from the day you go in. The acronyms, all of that stuff, right? You have to learn all of that. Same in prison. But we do more for prisoners than we do for veterans. Prisoners get out, we put them in halfway houses, we put them in pre-releases, we, we show them how to get jobs and those kind of things. And we go find employers and say, hey, we're going to send these people to you. And sometimes that's a Subway sandwich shop. I did that for a year. I managed those for a year. And I had a lot of pre-release guys in that, in that environment. That's a whole other podcast, by the way, managing <laughs> Subway sandwich, managing 13 Subway sandwich shops. That's a whole other <laughs> And I saw the efforts that we went through to help these people reintegrate so that they could become productive, tax-paying citizens that give back to the communities after whatever challenges that they've had previously. Veterans? We create 1,300 veterans a day. The Department of Defense creates 1,300 veterans a day with their family. So that's about 5,000 people, all told, who did the math. And we dump them into the civilian side. And there's some places for them to go. You can go to the VFW and those type of things, and they work on your veteran stuff. And you got the Veterans Administration and, and those type of things. And you got to remember, we come with stuff, some of those things that I mentioned. But the one thing that we all have in common is we're coming out of the institution, and now we have to go reassimilate. It's not like PCS and it's not like doing a permanent change of station, even though you have to reassimilate that way. You have to completely reassimilate. Well, civilian employers are better equipped to hire somebody that was incarcerated or hire a disabled person. Right? So if I come into your office for a job interview and I'm in a wheelchair and I'm deaf in my right ear, almost every employer on the planet knows exactly what their workspace needs to look like, what the bathrooms need to look like, what your cubicle needs to look like, what the staff needs to be told, who's going to be assigned to get you out of the building and a fire, all of those things. When a veteran shows up, very few civilian employers, institutions, some of the big ones are, have got some cool stuff. Deloitte has got some really cool stuff. But guess what? All of us that get out aren't qualified to go work at Deloitte. And oh, by the way, we live in Circle, Montana and not Dallas, Texas. So... <laughs> And so the civilian employers that we go to are not veteran ready. This is vet ready. Because as we talked about, James, in our pre-chat, when we have things in the military, especially, but in life, when we have failure, we ask two questions right off the bat. First of all, who, right? If somebody crashed, if your kid calls you and says, we got in a car accident, you say, where are you driving? And if the answer is yes, you go, where were you driving? Well, I was on this kind of road doing that. So you've never driven on the ice. Why were you driving on the ice? Right? So you weren't trained, right? We always go after training. Think about your time in the army or whatever. We, if something fails, everybody says, were they trained? And if so, were they current? And if they were current, mm -hmm. were they current on the most current piece of equipment or whatever we were, right? So why haven't we trained civilian employers to do what comes after thank you for your service? 
which I have to steal that from a friend of mine. It's down in Arizona. I always say, if you're truly thankful for something, you always want to give back. You want to show thanks in, in return. And this is the way to do that. It's to get veteran ready. And so here in Billings, I'm working with the Chamber of Commerce, and hopefully they decide to, well, I think we're close, but they decide to sanction a gold ribbon veteran ready certification that once their business is through my training program, that we make them vet ready. They get the little logo on their website, but when veterans are coming out, they can actually identify vet ready institutions that are ready to take them on and help them assimilate. So they've established some sense of community. They have established a feedback loop. They've established some structure and some expectations. They're aware of the fact that veterans may need to take a time out. I don't like to use the word time out, but, but they, they're going to have needs that can be interwoven into, into the work environment. No different than if you hire somebody that comes out of prison and they've got to go take a urine test because they're on parole, you have to let them go. You have to let them leave work. Well, if I have a mental health appointment, why should I have to schedule that on my off hours? Why can't I have my mental health appointment for an hour during work and have those things set aside to do that? And to have conversations, to have forums so that we can talk. We spend one third of our life at work. Yet when we come out as veterans, that piece is not solid. So we wander around in there. My experience, I show up, I'm a, can, I'm a retired command chief, master sergeant. I had up close to 10,000 people underneath me doing a nuclear mission across the whole northern tier of the United States. And I get into an institution and people are like, yeah, that's just a military thing. Or I'm like, hey, we should probably do it this way because I've done it. And boy, a lot of just hand waving and stay in your lane. And who do you think you are? And this is an executive thing. And I'm like, well, I've been an executive. So I have a certain level of expertise, but they don't know how to handle that. And quite frankly, I didn't know how to handle it. What you want to do is, and I'm just going to use a term here and I don't want people to to think that I'm like violent, but it's just kind of a term. It makes you want to choke people out, right? It makes you, you may, you know, I saw your head nod and your eyes kind of. Yeah, like, yeah you, you just want to shake them. Yeah, you're right, exactly. <laughs> How many times can I drag you over here and read my resume? You want to take them and read my last citation, my last decoration. Do something so that you can utilize me properly. This is not, I'm better than you. This is just, I speak Klingon and you speak Martian and we're not comfortable coming together. So I like that one of my keynote speeches is the 25-yard gap. And I use the 25-yard gap as an example. I was made to be a squad leader in basic training. So I'm in basic training for four days, the, the instruct, training instructor says, you're going to be a squad leader. I go, what does that mean? And he goes, yeah, you're in charge of these 12 guys. Make sure that they get through basic training and they don't screw up. Really? Okay. Well, the distance in a barracks is about 25 yards. One of the things I learned at 19 years old, when I was given 12 people to be in charge of, to make sure that they got every place they were supposed to be on time, those kind of type of things was, I had to walk those 25 yards and find out about the guy at the far end of the barracks that I was in charge of. And that's an uncomfortable walk. You don't know how that conversation's going to go. You know nothing about him. You're culturally, you're not aligned. I can tell you the 12th guy, his name was Bradley. He ended up being a medic like me. And so we went to technical school together. And stayed in touch through his time. He, I think he got out at six years. And we stayed in touch. That guy was not from a dairy farm in Northern California. That guy was from inner city Philadelphia. He was black. He was from inner city Philadelphia. He was probably not Roman Catholic. He, oh, there was all kinds of stuff that he wasn't that I was and vice versa. But how do you close that gap? That's really uncomfortable, right? Especially at 19 years old. Well, I would argue that the only reason that we haven't done at ready at a level is one, it's hard, requires sustainability, right? It's culture change. And when anytime you ask somebody to change culture or add to their culture, they're apprehensive to do that because it causes disruption. Well, that disruption I look at is growth, positive growth. And so you got to get people ready to do that. And, and so there's a value statement that goes along with this, which everybody needs that. A lot of that's tied to monetary stuff because 43 out of every 100 veterans leave their job in the first year, James. That's way too many. And most of them end up in the bar. They don't go to another job. And then you're at the bar, and then that's where you're getting at your advice. And when you're not in your right state of mind, the demons start to creep in, whatever those are, and then get into bad places to include it culminating in self-elimination. And that's just unsat. It's unsatisfactory. So I think that there's a lot of civilian employers out there that would say, I really too, truly do appreciate your service. How can I pay you back? So what comes after thank you for your service is this. It's an investment. You have to do that. 
somebody asked me, they said, this is tough because you're asking people to do change and some people don't want to do it. <laughs> well, if an employer says to me, Dave, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm up for this kind of change. I would say then you're probably not ready to be veteran ready. Here's my card. Give me a call if you reconsider and then we can work on your culture. But if you're not all in, then I'm wasting my time and we're going to come up with some Frankenstein looking thing that really doesn't serve the veteran, right? Because you can't pick and choose. You have to be all in. And like I said, there's companies out there. I found 28. I'd say out of the 28, there's about half a dozen that are really digestible for me that says these people have put in the work to get this done. And like I said, Deloitte, there's probably the best example. If somebody wants to look at something that says, here's a company that is veteran ready, it's probably them. They put some resources and time into it. I didn't help them do that. It's not structured the way that I do it because I want to take it a step further and I want the civilian employers to feel like they actually have learned the first 200 words of claim. Because if you can do that, you close the gap, right? The 25 yards gets smaller. And if the civilian employer can walk 12 and a half, with the veterans, we're used to walking the other 12 and a half. You just need a guy like me to facilitate and tell those guys, okay, calm down. Civilians are not savages. They don't manage their clocks like we do, right? They're going to be five to 10 minutes late to meetings because the way they schedule their stuff, it's back to back. So they've got to walk to meetings and stuff runs over. And so they give themselves the grace of that. We think that they're undisciplined savages. And it, neither one of those is true. The civilians probably could be more efficient with their time, right? And we can start to assimilate to a new culture and take a deep breath and back off. But until we have the conversation, until somebody's in the room to say, hey, here's the phenomenon, right? The guys like you and I, show up an hour early for work. We've already, well, first of all, we've already done some sort of physical exercise. Then we show up an hour early for work. Then we work all day. Then we work an hour and a half late, check all of our emails on a Saturday, do a double check on Sunday. And on Monday morning, we've got a whole agenda and we're ripping ready to go. And a, and a civilian counterpart to there, and they got to get two cups of coffee under their belt and get caught up in the chain and, <laughs> and nothing starts until nine o'clock. And they think that you're showing off or trying to take their job. And quite frankly, because of the way we're trained and with the strategy and the leadership and the emotional intelligence and the ability to critical think, we make them uncomfortable because they, they think we're motivated by something we're not. We're just doing what we do. So all that has to just be tempered. So that's kind of where we're at. And I think that the second and third order effects to this that are magnificent is, I think by doing this, we get a decrease in the severity of the mental health needs. We get a decrease in suicide and other aberrant issues like having to go into inpatient rehab for substance abuse and those type of things. And we open the door for our veterans to get that sense of community back, which when you have a sense of community, you can start to have the harder conversations, which means all the tough guys out there let their guard down enough so that we can actually get help, ask for help, and start down that journey too. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, definitely not allowing yourself to let the guard down. That's probably like dealing with first responders, military people, and what I do with behavioral health. They don't want to be labeled. They don't want to see a psychiatrist. They don't want to see a therapist. But the way I prefer to approach it, I'm a licensed outcome to a counselor and I could, I could charge a hundred dollars an hour, but I'm going to charge you $25 an hour. And just tell you that, hey, I'm an educator. We're, we're here to learn about some things. And then hopefully in that time, if they decide to kind of move on, but at least you're getting that help, but you're not being labeled as I'm, I'm seeing a psychiatrist, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's why I really, really prefer just sticking to the education on what we do, because I've had tons of people tell me that. And it was like, well, I'd rather be talking to you than talking to so on and so forth. And most of them are military people, police officers, you know, firefighters. So I'm like, hey, any way I get in there to help, you know, I'm, I'm definitely there to help. And when you well, talk about like transition, I've worked in, with incarcerated individuals for better part of a decade. And the little quote we give them, reentry starts the day you're incarcerated. How come that's not a motto for the military? Yeah, I think it should be vet ready for civilian employers and vet reach for the DOD. And in there, vet reach has got to be 
starting to talk about the afterlife while you're in the current life. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So when you, when you walk down and you'll be able to elaborate on this because you're professionally you do it. Well, let me tell you a story. I'm a master storyteller, so you'll have to bear with me. So when I was the command chief at Hill Air Force Base, we had the second largest explosive ordnance disposal flight in the United States Air Force. And so these EOD guys were EOD guys, right? Because the EOD guys are <laughs> all, they're all trained in the same place in Florida, right? Marines, Navy, Army, they all go yeah. to the same place and they all know how to blow things up and they know how to find things and get rid of things. And so during the height of Iraq, Afghanistan, there was just a huge appetite for these guys. So we had Air Force guys in front of Marine units, sweeping and clearing IEDs and the line. Well, I lost three guys out of that unit to combat casualties. And when we lost Chris Soulsby, Tech Sergeant Chris Soulsby, because I'm an independent duty medic, which all EOD people have one of those assigned to them, all units, they, and I was the senior enlisted guy, they invited me to their, their memorial for Chris. And what they do is they put themselves in, in, in a room, it's a training room, and they have slideshows and they put up slideshows of Chris, right? And it's Chris at a picnic, it's Chris in training, it's Chris at work, it's Chris and his family. Lots of tears, lots of anger, lots of fist pounding, all the stuff that goes along with this grieving, right? This loss, adapting to loss. And everybody's at a different stage of that grieving. And they finish up. So I'm the only outsider in there, but considered an insider because I have a specialty that is part of that. And when it's all said and done, one of the E7s stands up. Great guy. Great guy. Great leader. He stands up and he says, he says, Chief, how do you think we're doing? And I said, I think you guys suck. I said, but this is terrible. And now everybody turned around. I was sitting at the top of this little amphitheater, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody turns around, they look at me. And I said, because here's the deal. I said, you're doing group think while you're trying to get healthy. And I said, all you're doing is you're only sharing with yourselves. You're not letting anybody in that can professionally help you. And you're adding 10 more pounds to your rucksack and increasing the incline on the hill. And you're just running more and beating up your physical body because your mental body's hurting. And then you're dumping in all the things that numb you, which is usually alcohol and other things. You're doing all of that stuff to yourself. And there's all these people out there to help you and you're not letting them. Well, to your point, right? Well, they're not qualified. They've never been in the, in the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. How would they know? Well, they know because they're treating your mind. They can build a level of empathy if you share with them. Like we can talk about some moral injury stuff. I own it, man. I own PTSD and I own moral injury. I'm that guy. And, and I'll tell you, I dealt with it the wrong way and I've dealt with it the right way. And I'm in the right way stage right now. And, and so here's, here I am using the energy that all that bleeds off to do something with it. So what we did with those guys, what I quickly realized was they needed a community. They needed an environment with people like yourself in the environment that they could go see. And the Air Force had always had flight medicine, right? So if you flew an airplane, you got a flight surgeon, you had a doctor. And everybody saw that doctor. Your wife saw the doctor, your kids saw the doctor. That doctor was your doctor. It was attached to your squadron, your flying squadron. That doctor wore the flight suit and flew with you and had all the patches and everything that went along with it. It's a big deal. And we said, well, why don't we have that same environment for our high-risk special operations type people? Our pararescue guys, our forward controllers, our, our EOD guys, even some of our transportation guys that were running convoys in this kind. Why don't we have an operational medicine area where they've got this one person that is their doctor, right? That's where they, their center focus is. That's where they're referred to. That's where all this stuff goes to so that they can build this level of trust. Um, a really smart lieutenant colonel at the time that was in charge of those areas in the, in the hospital took that, ran with it, kind of made it her... She's championed it all the way through to the to the point where they're going to put a second star on her, and she's going to be the the assistant surgeon general for the United States Air Force for readiness and nursing. So, and she made all that happen. So we changed the whole culture based around that. And not until we did that did people not start getting better. So there, I mean, there's a real story, right, about how this works, all everything that we're talking. Yeah. So I know it can happen. I know it can be done. That was all conceived on two elliptical machines in the gymnasium at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And the two of us are highly motivated and very average IQ people. So this doesn't take rocket science. It just takes passion, motivation, and you got to have a level of empathy and some experience. So, yeah. 
unfortunately, I think it kind of really depends on the environment. Being from the Marine Corps, we kind of take pride in struggling and the toughness and all this machismo type mm -hmm. thing. And I think it'd be very hard for a lot of change to really take place. <laughs> I'm hoping things have changed, but I know that when I was in there, it was look at look at these people, different branches are having like timeouts and oh, mental yeah. health and all this stuff. And the Marine Corps is just kind of hard charging. And unfortunately, you have that mentality while you're in, and then when you get out, you have that mentality. And yeah. uh, like like you said earlier, you, you're looking on other people. I remember when I was in. They're like, they're trying to get you to stay. So like, you don't go out there, these filthy civilians and they're lazy, they're this, and you come out there with that mindset and yeah, they don't have the same work mentality. They don't have the same experience as you do. And you do tend to kind of want to judge them, but you, you're just hurting yourself. <laughs> right. Right. And so there, there you are. That's the first 90 second soundbite when you have all the veterans in the room in an organization that's trying to get that ready. When, when Dave walks into the room and I've got, you know, six or seven veterans sitting there, what you just said is exactly what needs to be said out loud. So you close that gap. This is really about proximity. We spend a lot of time. And I'll say our American society is even worse because of the way, the way we consume media. We spend a lot of our time consuming what affirms our beliefs and then making assumptions on everything else that's out there and conducting business that way. Well, you know, as well as I do, especially being a Marine, assumptions are always wrong. You know, could you imagine walking up to your, to your Sergeant Major or your gunny and saying, <laughs> well, I assumed that's, a, that's no way. There's no way. What do you mean you assumed? Did you do recon? No, we just assumed. Yeah, that level of assumption in a Marine Corps is that equates to dead Marines. So you can't do that. But yet we do. I mean, we manage a lot of things in our space on assumption. And because it's a scary place to get rid of the assumptions and to close the gap, then you've got to go into uncomfortable spaces and talk to people that don't necessarily think like you, believe the same things you believe, motivated the same way, all the way down to lifestyles and religion and even the languages we speak. But People don't wake up in the morning and want to do a bad job or destroy an institution. Or that. It just doesn't, that's not the case. Civilians do not wake up and say, I'm going to go to work and, and be a screw off today. They just themselves. So you got to learn how to, how to understand that. So, yeah, but to your point, you know, Marines have to be trained to run towards gunfire and that's not natural. And Marines have to be trained in teams, small teams, right? You guys win on small teams. You don't win on big mass. So you got to win on small teams, which means there's a, such a high level of trust that you don't look to your three and your nine because somebody's got that, right? And your six, you don't do that. You look straight forward and you cover what's in front of you because that's what you do. And, and somebody's got you, you're right and you're loud. And you get out in the civilian world and then something happens, you're like, you didn't have my six. Well, <laughs> what is a six? They don't even know what a six is because they're not trained that way, right? And so once you have that experience and it's negative, it's kind of a setback because then when you really do need somebody to have your six, and I'm talking about alcohol and substance, suicidal ideation, when you really do need to have somebody to have your six, your whole world is full of people that may have not had your six. And it's not because they don't want to have it. They just don't even know what it means. So how do you close that gap? And we need to do that. It sounds like you're in a great position to be doing that. So people need to think about that. But that ready has got a whole process in there about how to do those things to include facilitation. It's okay to take a break from work and have a little bit of a facilitated conversation with veterans about what do you think? Can you imagine what an open-minded employer would learn if he took a bunch of veterans and said, hey guys, everybody come in here. I've got something that's been killing me for three months. And the vets would go, what is that? And they'd go, he'd say, we can't get this seven ton thing across this space in three and a half hours to this other space because that it has to be there in three and a half hours or we can't get done or we need to get done and we're losing money. If you gave that to a room full of veterans, let's just say there's one from every service and there's two officers in there and a couple senior enlisted guys and everybody else is in there. In an hour, you would have four <laughs> courses of action, 
you'd actually have five courses of action and one of them would be so ridiculous it would just make you laugh but you have to add that one because that's our sense of humor right you'd have four courses of action with subset options to each of those four courses of action right and a plan of execution and guess what if they threw barriers up in front of us what we'd say is, yeah. okay, everybody come out or you grab one quarter and we'll just brute force it. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just show you that we can just brute force this thing mm -hmm. in three and a half hours. Can you imagine if you could have one company just do that for, for six months? Can you imagine how much money they would save? Yeah, and I think it goes back to like what you said earlier about the various places that I've worked is that people don't like change. They don't like to do anything different. And... We're from the mentality of problem solving, fixing, what's the most efficient, work smarter, not harder, that whole mentality. But when you're surrounded by people, I'm putting in my time, I don't get my paycheck, I don't care about the company, I don't care if it does well or whatnot, I'm just here. It really, really plays a toll. And like here recently with my day job, I had to kind of step away from what I've been used to for eight, nine years, just to kind of relieve the stress because nobody wanted to change. Nobody wanted to better things. So I had to kind of go in a different direction because it just got to be too much stress on me and then kind of bleeding over into my family. So I was like, I can't have that. But it's that whole mentality of, I want to make this the best that it can be and then get constant pushback. Well, and so the conversation is, why the pushback, right? And I'm telling you, it's a speed limit. They stick this magical transmission, man, and you're a Marine, so your transmission has actually got one a little bit extra in it. But they do this transmission change in basic training for the enlisted people or OTS or, or the academies or whatever ascension for the officers. They do this transmission change. And in that transmission, they add to the one that we came with, they add two high gears. There's the gear that you run in all the time, which is max gear. And then you get to downshift only one gear. And that's usually when you're on leave or you're, or you're changing stations for PCS, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get to downshift to that. But other than that, you run in that high gear. Well, what they don't do is they don't give you your old transmission back when you get out. And so you're operating in this high gear. So to your phenomenon, you look at stuff and you're can-do, right? You're can-do guy. Somebody says, oh, we got an obstacle. You go, oh, let's do these things. It wears people out. They're like, wait a minute. I'm three cups of coffee, nine to noon, an hour for lunch, one to four, 4.30, and I'm out. And oh, by the way, when the door closes behind me and I'm on my way to the parking lot, I am completely out. I shut this off. For however long we served, we never shut off. Just because you left the unit, you didn't shut off. You got home and you didn't shut off. In fact, sometimes you got home and what did you do? You took one uniform off and the other one went on the ironing board and the, and the shoe polish came out because mm -hmm. you're prepping for the next day. So you're never really done. So I dated myself, right? Boot polish. Nice. That kind of, <laughs> yeah. that kind of, I, I lived, I lived through polish and no polish and yeah, three, yeah. three gas masks and three sidearms. So there's, you know, there's a lot of change there. I think we're highly equipped. We're highly capable and we're really scary, scary people for civilian organizations. And so we just need to temper that with a good conversation. Vets have got to move a little towards the middle. The civilians need, I think most of them really want to do the right thing, but they don't understand it. And we come on so strong that it, it can become a negative thing. And, and then what happens is you bag it, right? As soon as respect stops being served, you bag it. And because we're all respect and right? core values. Look at the words in our creed. The first, the first module of Vet Ready is having civilians listen to the creeds of all the services, the Ranger Creed, the Soldier's Creed, the Airman's Creed, Marine, the Rifleman's Creed. They have to listen to all that because that's tattooed on us. Mm -hmm. This is not a wash off, right? Mm -hmm. It's on us. And you do that with civilians and they're like, well, that's really highly motivating. I said, what do you do with a person that that's them? I will never falter. I will never fail. I will never leave an airman behind. Think about those things. And you show up and people are like, no, 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 that's too much. Yeah, we don't need to do that. No, we're going to do it. We're not, we're not getting an F on anything. No F share. Everything's going to be A plus. That scares <laughs> people. It makes them uncomfortable. So, and that's okay. Because civilian employers can save our lives. They can really create an mm -hmm. environment to save our lives. And that's, that's, that's really the end goal. Yeah. And speaking on what you talked about earlier, I was an NCO. I didn't do 30 years in the Marines. 
but you're in charge people. I wasn't in charge of a ton of people. I was in charge of probably 12, but you got 12 different personalities, 12 different backgrounds. I was from the South. It seemed like the way I talk offended some people and some people thought it was funny, but yet I'm in charge. But the main thing is mission accomplishment. That's mission, mission, That's it. mission. That's, That's it. right. So you'd have people kind of bickering with each other and it's like, Hey, cut that out. And you'd have to counsel them and you really learn to deal with people and have them get along nicely. So mission accomplishment. And then you're doing that at 18, 19, 20 years mm-hmm. old. And yeah. then you get in the civilian world and you might as well be straight out of high school. <laughs> so let me give you, let me give you some numbers here. Cause this is another piece of kind of my mission. The average person in America starts leading people like you described at about the age of 30. They graduate college, they go through their trade schools or whatever. And by the age of 30, they're given a human, right? It's the first time in their life they're responsible for another human. All the stuff you just described. They do that job for about nine years and then they get a job that sounds like director, which means that they're in charge of humans who are in charge of humans. By the age of 42, they get their first leadership training and development. We started getting developed as leaders. On the first day when we were standing out on the, where for you, out on a grinder somewhere, picking them up, putting them down, picking them up. Right then, the first time the TI is yelling at you and calling you whatever he's calling you, right? And, mm-hmm. and I can't wait to get you in the barber chair and shave you clean and make you look like, so everybody looks the same. All of that stuff, right? That's all leadership. That's all the tearing down and the rebuilding. All of those things that go along with it. And most people don't have that. So. Think about a civilian employer that doesn't understand what you just explained. And they think that you're just another person in the pile. They don't even know how to mine that. They don't even know how to mine that for their own organization. So we've got to teach them how to open the mine and how to pull that step out and how to facilitate it, right? When we did COVID here in town, I worked with the community as, as operations chief on our task force or COVID incident command when we started. And the incident commander, who is our public health officer, said, this is to our community, right? This is the mayor and the whole shooting. He said, Dave is a chief and we are going to need chief stuff. So Dave, I'm turning the meeting facilitation, all this stuff, all the, the mission, right? He said, I'm turning it over to you to do the chief thing. So if Dave irritates you, just get over it because we're going to use him because this is what he knows how to do. Now think, now this is a guy that didn't have any military background, but he'd been a leader in other spaces and, and gone through some pretty rough stuff. Think about that. Think about what he just did for me and for everybody else, right? So he unleashed the crack. And did I make some people unhappy? Oh, yeah, because it's so counterintuitive, right? Especially when you fall into a military structure. It's so counterintuitive. But I had to work on that, right? I had to make sure I was consensus building, spending more time building the right thing. So, yeah, I believe in people. 99.9% of people are good, James. The, the 0.1% that are bad, they're the ones that get make national news every day. And so we tend to think that those percentages, they're good people. They want to do the right things. They just need to know. And that education and training are the key to anything. As soon as you're trained, you know, if somebody passes out with a heart attack in front of you and you don't know CPR, you feel helpless. If you know CPR, you're trained to do something. It's that simple. Give people the right training, the right information, and they will figure out how to get to the right place for everybody. So we need to do that. We can even recondition Marines. I have Marines in my life that uh, they're salvageable. No, I'm just picking on them. <laughs> no, I, it, Marines, are, Marines are a tough one because you guys are rub some dirt on it, suck it up, get up, fill the hole, mission first, move forward. Right? Always forward. Mm-hmm. And that's rough when you get into civilian organizations that have a whole different speed limit, a whole different mission set. And Quite frankly, they put core values on the wall. They look sexy. You're hoping that they do them. And when they don't demonstrate them, it all starts to go south because there's an integrity piece that goes along with that. And we're all found it in that. So, yeah. yeah, I definitely agree with what you say about the 99% of people are, are good. I've been in the corrections field for as long as I have. I've sat across from murderers, you name it. Inherently, these are good people who did stupid things at a time of weakness. And there is that 1% that, Hey, these people are exactly where they need to be, but it's really hard for them when they get out. 
And I view it the same as somebody in the military getting out. It's hard. It's a different environment. And you talk about institutionalized. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the exact same thing. And I think that's probably a lot of the passion of what I do working with incarcerated individuals because I, I do see that connection. I do see that reentry is so tough and that change of environment, but the education, the training is paramount. And thankfully, I work for a sheriff that he believes in training, education, um, sure. but it's also the whole, you can lead a horse to water, but I can't make them drink. But the fulfillment that I get is, hey, I've given them the tools, what they decide to do with them, that's on them. It's definitely unfortunate the way we treated military and uh, our incarcerated individuals. Do you, do you know what the one difference is between the two? If you're incarcerated and you want to go back, you can just rub them. If you're out of the military and you want to go back, odds are you can't. Mm-hmm. So once you take a step out, you're out. Now, some people would say, well, I took the uniform off one day and walked into, I got a cousin. Did, did over 20 years prior enlisted officer retires a major and told me, he goes, I literally took the uniform off one day, put a suit on the next day, did the same job. His assimilation was perfect because he didn't leave the culture, right? He's around the same batch of folks. So his assimilation is perfectly fine. And some people get opportunities to do that. They go to work for Lockheed Martin or something like that. But your average straight leg grunt, Marine, soldier, airman that did four, six years, even eight, you know, even 10. Those people don't do that. They've got to come back out into this. And yeah, and if you're struggling in the first year, you can't say, you know what, I'm going to go back in. Because you don't. If you're incarcerated, you, you can go back. Mm-hmm. And some do, right? You, you see you see recidivism. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, quite a bit. I know when I got out, the economy had tanked. The U.S. was in turmoil, probably should have been watching more news, what was going on in the world. And I I was looking hard, couldn't find work nowhere. And I was looking hard about going back in because I just, it was just such a shock. And I couldn't get a job at Walmart, you know, I mean, just the most basic minimum wage job, nobody was hiring. And it it was definitely a shock to the system. (laughs) But I thought I'd tough it out and try to make things work and had to do a lot of manual labor type stuff. And I was lucky enough to actually land a job and and I did that for several years. And, but yeah, it's definitely tough. And I know when I was getting out, the whole re-entry program that we had was basically trying to get you to stay and trying to scare you into staying. and didn't really offer much advice or whatever. I think I was out probably three or four years before I was advised to, Hey, you probably need to sign up with the VA health department. And I'm like, I never really thought about it because there was told these things. It's just like, right. and you're out there and, but yeah, it, it's, there's a lot of stuff that we're not told. Sure. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. So, yeah, you know, the only thing that we didn't cover that we probably talked about previously was moral injury. And you understand that because you come across it. But I find there's a big gap. Even even in, in professional circles, there's a gap. And the understanding of the difference, you know, between PTSD and moral injury. And because they do run congruent. And sometimes your PTSD can be part of your moral injury. But, but we're asked to do things that are very counterintuitive to the way we were programmed in our inner child, our programming when we were younger to include how we grew up and, again, our religious, cultural values, ethics, all the things that that we come with. And then you get in the Department of Defense and they start to ask you to do things that are completely counterintuitive to that. And orders are orders, right? And we have things like, you can be court-martialed and shot, desertion in a a war zone, all those kind of things. And then I actually have got a couple of stories that, that hedge on that. I won't share them today. Second book's coming out. It's got that stuff in it. I'll share that with you when we get it. But but moral injury is a real thing. And you don't have to be getting shot at or swinging a trenching tool in a foxhole fighting off the enemy 
to have moral injury. You can get boxed into places where you have to do stuff that beats up on you a little bit and you gotta carry those things with you. And I've got more than one incident in my career. And so that requires the same type of help, same type of conversations and, and can drive you to the bad places too. And I think you're going to find that that's even more prevalent than true PTS. So yeah, for those of you listening out there, you need to read up on it. For those of you that have it, you need to treat it the same way as you would any other health condition and go see your doctor, go get some help. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Unfortunately, that's one of the hardest thing for us, us military type, us men folk and, and female folk, when you're trained in such a way, asking for help, that is the hardest thing to do. I could definitely talk in great lengths about transition. Sure. Because man, it's tough and I advise anybody that's looking to transition from the military is to do your homework, educate yourself because you might not get it from the DOD side. And so with your MaxFab consulting, yeah. you're Montana. Yeah. Is it all in person? Is it virtual? Yeah, well, you know, they can, yeah. Well, for the individual, if they want to do a three, four to 30 minute consultation, just jump on the website, click on contact us and schedule through my calendar. It's on there. Calendar is actually set up for an hour. And I'll talk to anybody. If they want to continue the relationship, then we'll, we'll do something that's reasonable, but to pay me for my time. Yeah. And we can have a conversation and kind of steer people the right way and just be a resource for them. Yeah. Too easy. You bet. All right. We'll wrap it up right there. We've been at about an hour or so. And thank you for being on here. And hopefully people get the message. Yeah. I'll post it and. Let me know when the next book comes out. You bet. I'll post a link to the, the current book. Yeah. Sure. Let's do it again. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thanks, James. You're a good man. We'll stay in touch. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, that was our interview with Mr. David Nordell. Hopefully you learned something about the difficulties in transitioning from military to civilian life. And if you know of any businesses that want to become vet ready, please pass on his information. Uh, you can tell him to listen to this podcast, pass it on to your local chamber of commerce. Like he said, he'll talk to anybody, free consultation. Just go to his website, maxfabconsulting.com. I will be sure to leave a link in the uh, description and if you have any topics that you want covered, please let us know. If you need any of our services, behavioral health, education, anger management, things of that nature, please contact me and visit our website, freedomanger.com. And as always, till next time, stay safe. Mm -hmm.